Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator Troy. So I want to say something fairly, hopefully short and concise about the Viking Sword and Shield. Before I go on, I just want to remind everyone that we don't have any technical sources. That is, we don't have any fencing treatises or anything like that. We don't even really have any sources from this period describing really very detailed combat accounts either. Um, so when we come to talk about Viking era, so you know early medieval basically, um, weapons and how they were used, we have to rely on, on a, what a lot of people would describe as experimental archaeology, that is using the available art sources, um, studying the actual artifacts themselves, studying what written sources there are, and trying to come up with something plausible. In the case of HEMA, we've got the advantage as well of being able to look at later period sources um, from the 14th century onwards, which we do have those technical sources describing, you know, fencing treatises describing specifically how weapons are used. But that being said, of course, that's, you know, four or five hundred years later. So um, you have to be very careful extrapolating how weapons are used in the 15th or 16th century in relation to how they might have been used in the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. But um, the point that I really want to address in this video, um, as quickly as possible really, is the use of the shield in terms of which parts of it might be used to block with. Now, uh, the other day I noticed a statement by someone who um, regarded themselves, I suppose, as an expert on um, Dark Age weapons. Well, first of all, are there any experts? Well, clearly there's some people who have studied these weapons and the use of them more than others, so in that sense, yes. But at the same time, it's very difficult to say what's wrong and right for all the aforementioned reasons. We don't have a lot of source material to go upon. I'm not incidentally suggesting therefore that we shouldn't try, but we should also always caveat whatever we say about weapons used in this era with the facts that we do know, which are fairly small, all of the guesswork and admit that it's guesswork and then be open to other interpretations whilst also, as I've pointed out in previous videos, accepting that in any period there isn't only one way to skin a cat and very often weapons were used in different ways by different groups of people even at the same time and certainly across a period of time. So the way that one person might have used this sword and shield in uh, Anglo-Saxon London uh, in the 9th century might not be the same way that a, um, a Danish person would use this sword and shield in um, an Aarhus um, in Denmark at the same time. Uh, equally, that person in London using their sword and shield, might, they might use them differently to how someone at the time of the Norman Conquest might have used a sword and shield. Anyway, I won't go on uh, on that point. But the shield, so the statement that was made was that ah, you should never ever block with the edge of the shield. Uh, so if a, if a blow is incoming, if someone swung a blow at you, you should never ever stick the edge in any direction into the incoming blow. You should always receive it it on the flat. And I have seen a couple of quite well-known people say this as well. Now, um, saying always, dealing with absolutes, <laughs> is, is a dangerous business, especially, especially when we're talking about um, fighting in the early medieval period that we have so little source material for. And um, saying that you should never ever um, take a blow on the edge is, I would say, a foolhardy statement. Uh, for a start, if we look at the actual technical sources that we do know about, if we look at the 15th, 16th and uh, 17th century material that involves shields, we can see various different options used. Sometimes blows are taken on the uh, flat face of the shield at different angles. Sometimes they are um, more like uh, beats or deflections. Sometimes they're just covering a line. So sometimes the shield intercepts the incoming blow. Sometimes it stays where it is and receives the incoming blow, just the same as with parries with swords. Sometimes you beat into an incoming blow, sometimes you just receive the incoming blow. And equally, sometimes uh, we see the edge being used uh, in various different ways. We see the edges used to manipulate the opponent's shield, which is something that Roland Vorchek has talked quite a bit about in relation to these um, Viking era um, boss grip shields. Uh, and we can see that if we look at the 15th century dueling shield texts. Um, but also, 
you have, I was going to say you have a series of edges on the shield, but technically you have one edge, but it goes all the way around. And because, of course, you do have an orientation with this type of shield, um, you essentially have a strong and a weak. The resistance is strong there, uh, but, but weak there because of the pivot, okay? And that works, obviously, on the front of the shield. You can pivot it here, but you can't pivot it very easily there, okay? But of course your opponent can't tell which way around your shield is being uh, gripped, so you can change your strong and weak quite uh, quickly and easily uh, to resist whatever they're trying to manipulate on your shield. Um, but you can use the shield in a number of different ways to op uh, oppose an incoming blow or to interrupt or uh, push aside, deflect uh, incoming blows. Um, so for example, if a blow is coming straight down the middle towards my head, yes indeed, I could receive it like that, on the flat of uh, the shield more or less. Equally, I could extend the shield out and receive it here, which we see in uh, Morozzo, for example, 16th century. Badum. You could do two things at the same time, you can block and attack back. Okay. Equally, I could shove the edge up there, and I'll talk about that option for a minute, but so I could almost receive it on the edge passively, or I could use the edge offensively, and this is something we see uh, in later texts as well, whereby the edge is ploughed into the incoming blow and specifically into the person's hand and arm. So if someone swung their sword at my head like this, you can, instead of just receiving it I would, either with the uh, flat or with the um, edge somehow, you can actually plough into it with the edge straight into their incoming weapon or into their hand or arm, which might injure them, might hurt them, certainly disrupt the blow. It might occupy their sword better to enable you to either uh, cut back at them or thrust back at them, whatever you want to do. Um, so there are a number of different options. Now, so as well as all of those having different tactical um, advantages and disadvantages and increasing the variation of your fight, which is useful in trying to stay unpredictable and trying to oppose someone who's trying to kill you, um, you've got all of these different edges you can do, use in different ways, or rather different parts of the edge. You've got different parts of the flat. You've got different angles of the flat that you can do, receive as well. You can receive it completely flat, or you can receive it at an angle from various different angles. You can indeed, and this might be quite foreign to some people, even take it on the flat on the inside and come round that way, which we see again in some of the uh, judicial dueling shields uh, texts from the 16th, uh, 15th century and 16th. Um, so you've got a whole bunch of different options, but finally, I want to finish off on one thought. Why? So someone who says you always want to receive it on the flat, because if you receive it on the edge, the opponent's weapon might get stuck into the edge of your shield. And my response to that would be everything that I've said up to this point. Plus, if their weapon does get stuck in the edge of your shield, is that a bad thing for you? Or is that a bad thing for them? It might be a bad thing for both of you. But if you specifically know that that's going to happen and you want to, at least for a short period of time, maybe only for a split second, maybe for eternity, if you want to capture and control their weapon and they've swung a sharp cut at you and you deliberately let it bury itself in the edge of your shield, that might be useful, mightn't it? Just think about that for a minute. If you imagine a sharp sword has now embedded itself down into your shield and your sword is free, they can't use their sword, they've still got their shield, but they can't use their sword on you anymore because it's now buried in your shield and you can use your sword on them. So, I'm going to finish on that thought that sometimes we should, well for a start, we should never make categorical statements about a period of combat that we know so little about. Okay, that's the first rule. The second rule is don't make flat out statements about always doing something a certain way without having considered the possible advantages of doing it another way and also the possible circumstances where that other way might just happen anyway. It might not be intentional, but it still might have advantages attached to it. Just before I go, I know I'll get asked. The shield is from Shields Plus, link below and the sword is from Albion, um, and uh, I highly recommend these, very, very good swords, and I highly recommend Shields Plus, they're very nice shields. They're not the most historically accurate for this period of shield, but functionally speaking, they do the job, um, and they're a good, solid product, and they've never let me down. Thanks for watching, give us a like and a subscribe, and I'll see you really soon, again on Scholar Gladiatore channel, for another video. Cheers!
Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.